Okay, well, uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, Stuart's uh, talk about uh, our balloon program. Um, basically, uh, he's going to describe to you the mission that we've done yeah. um, and our sort of plan for the next, uh, um, for, for, for this year. The idea behind this, so what we're doing is we're launching balloons to um, a height of about 35 to 40 kilometers, that's the goal. Um, we've had one successful mission so far that she was going to describe. Um, the purpose behind this uh, balloon program, beside, besides space being impressive, um, is that it serves us in a, in a number of ways. So uh, we've got three main purposes behind it. One is it gives us a good platform for testing um, space-related payloads in near space conditions. Um, and that hopefully will be of interest uh, to some of you guys. Um, the other thing is it helps us to, to offer a service, and that's one of our goals, to offer a service to other scientific uh, um, people interested in putting payloads up at that, at that altitude and testing them. Um, and the third one, it helps us with outreach. So we want to use it as an outreach program for high school students. These are the primary um, goals. It's, as you'll see, it's impressive. So uh, space is always impressive. Uh, pictures are always, uh, these picture, pictures are always impressive and it, it's of a uh, great marketing value. So, um, without further ado, uh, uh, Stuart, if you don't know him, is the president of uh, BlueSat, so I'll leave him to, uh, to describe this. Well, hello everybody. Um, I'm, yeah, so I'm Stuart, I'm the president of BlueSat, and like Elias said, I'm gonna be talking a little bit today about our balloon program. So I'll just get right into it. So the three things, that kind of the three main topics I want to talk about today is a little bit of background on how all this got kicked off. A lot of folks here are familiar with this, so I'll move through it quite quickly, but how we ended up doing balloon stuff. The story so far, so what flight experience we do have, what we plan to do, and kind of how that worked out, and the lessons we learned from that. And then really where we want to take this in the future to make it useful to everyone here at UNSW. So this I can really skim through, because I, I wasn't sure if there were some people, some newer people were going to be here. We're the Student Space Engineering Project. 50% of the audience is from UNSW, is from BlueSet. Um, so as a way to get undergraduates, we were founded as a way to get undergraduates working on satellite hardware. Um, for, we worked on the original BlueSat project, which was to build an undergraduate satellite. And we, worked, we started that in, back in 1997, and then worked on that through 2013. And with a lot of hard work from the last generation of students and a lot of help from the faculty, the satellite was finally finished. So as they were finishing this satellite, the BlueSat teams kind of started going through the idea of now what? Like how do we demonstrate that this works? What's, how do we kind of cap off the project? And at the time, doing a rocket launch really wasn't feasible. It wasn't something we had the resources for. After that long development, it wasn't something the satellite really had the technical merit for. So we were looking around for other options. And eventually what the team hit on was this idea of flying it on a stratospheric balloon. They can take it up to the edge of space see how well it works in those conditions, and prove that it actually does stuff, but without the cost of actually buying our own decommissioned Russian ICBM. This, so that was the plan kind of at the end of 2013. <laughs> Hello, another BlueSat person. That was kind of the plan at the end of 2013, which was when I started taking a much more active role in kind of organizing the project. When the team was originally working, this just, there was this idea that we were going to fly a balloon, but the team was mostly focused on finishing the satellite itself. So it was only in late 2013 we really started looking into what this would involve. And we started to realize how big of an operation it would be. The BlueSat satellite with all the safety hardware it would need would weigh about 30 kilograms. This picture, which is strangely low resolution, I didn't realize that before, don't know what's going on there. Um, this picture is an example of a balloon roughly on the scale that we would need to fly a payload that big. It's yep. behind you as well. It's oh, okay, cool. That's a better screen. So that's a balloon roughly on the scale that we might need. See that with the filling hose? That's a person. So that's a pretty that's a pretty large logistical operation. And we started to realize just the scale of that undertaking and started to do the math as to whether it would really be worth it. And also we started to realize working with Ca as we began to work with CASA, what a big kind of safety and regulatory obstacle this was going to be. And so eventually we started to step away from the idea of flying the big satellite. But this had gotten us onto the idea of balloons. And we started to realize that even though most of the challenges that we described, most of the issues we were running into, those only apply when you're trying to fly something the size of a building. For a little balloon, the, red, the obstacles are incredibly small. It's well within the capabilities of an undergraduate team. And it's actually a really cheap way, dollar for dollar, it's probably the cheapest way to fly anything, to get up to the edge of space and allow us to test things in those near space conditions. 
And especially with what BlueSat and UNSW is really moving toward, which is things like CubeSat hardware, things that weigh a few hundred grams, this is a really cool way for us to cheaply and easily get stuff up to the edge of space right here in Australia. So with the, within the legal framework we operate in, we can fly things up to four kilograms, and these balloons will take things anywhere from 25 to 33 kilometers up, or maybe a little further, depending on how you do your payload. So as I said, they're cheap. The single weather balloon, if you buy a good one, will cost you $100, $150. The single biggest cost is the helium. The nice thing about these kind of projects is if you're doing one, or if we're doing one, we're doing it within the cover of the university. So we have access to a lot of great university resources. Namely, they can get us the helium, which is the single biggest cost. If you're nice to the School of Physics, you can get that at a much better rate because the university buys that in bulk. Likewise, the university can give you things like we take advantage of university cars, and maybe most importantly, we have the university's liability coverage backing us up. So this makes the whole thing a lot easier and a lot safer than it would be if we were just a bunch of people out on the street trying to do this ourselves. We can also, it's also something we can do in-house. Our flights are performed by a crew of trained chimpanzees, also known as undergraduate students. And so they don't cost, that doesn't cost the university anything. We don't have to do a lot of external coordination other than getting legal approval with CASA. There's not a lot involved in running these things. We basically just check our boxes and then go out and do it. So this is something we can organize really on the order of weeks. If you look at the minimum times, once we get this everything down to science, we're hopefully it'll take between three and four weeks to actually organize a flight. So this is something we can do on a very regular basis with you know, relatively little overhead. So what are we actually flying? We're actually throwing up toward the great black. Well, the obviously you need a balloon. This is something, because weather balloons are still a technology, this is something you can buy off the shelf. At the moment, we're using balloons built by a German manufacturer called Stratoflex. They can lift, we, the nice thing about those is we can literally press a button and buy them. They lift about 2.5 kilograms. As I said, Castle will let us fly anything up to about four kilograms in our legal category. But four kilograms is actually really heavy for a commercial weather balloon payload. So, not a lot of people make commercial balloons off the shelf for that. You can order custom ones. It's not much more expensive. They just change the settings on their machine. But it's something you have to liaise with the, the manufacturers to do. So we're in the process of looking into, looking into doing that so we can push the limits of what we can do in our legal category. The way we do our tracking is we make use of an off-the-shelf technology called APRS, which is the Automatic Pack Reporting System. It's a network of amateur radio operators actually around the world. And so they have devices and then portal stations. So the devices are really anything a hobbyist is interested in, whether that's a balloon, a car, someone's ship, someone's private aircraft. And they have a GPS tracker on them, or that determines the GPS locations, and then spits that out over the APRS network. And then there are privately operated APRS base stations around the world, which receive these signals and post them onto the internet. So you can see here is a, a map of New South Wales with all of the APRS devices and base stations that are currently operating. And this is really great. One, because it's a resource for us. It provides all the information, the trackers provide all the information we need. We get position, we get velocity, we get altitude. And also it's publicly visible. So when we did our most recent flight, we had several people who helped us organize the flight back here at UNSW. And even though they couldn't come out on the flight, we were able to send them the link to this map and tell them our call station. And they were able to follow along from home and know what was going on with the flight. And so what we really hope is as we're getting more into outreach, as we're getting more people involved in these kind of flights, this is a way that people at home can kind of join in on what's going on. And then finally, one of the, another thing we like to fly on our balloons is a termination device, something we're still ironing out the kinks in. It's not required. This is kind of a hangover from that old balloon design phase we talked about. So if you're flying something, you know, a 30 kilogram steel box that could kill somebody, you are required to have a termination device on it so you can end the flight at any time. For a light class balloon, that's not required, but it does give us a bit of control over the balloon, the more than we would otherwise have. And so we like having that ability to cut the balloon down through a radio signal from the ground when we want to. So as I said, putting what it, so what actually goes into one of these flights? So as I said, it takes about three weeks minimum to put one together. That's to get the regulatory clearance, get the team organized, get all the internal university stuff sorted out. If you're doing design work and development work and fixing things and troubleshooting things like we are at the moment, it takes a few weeks more. That should be gone eventually. <laughs> We currently run, a, the current plan is to run a BlueSat team of six students for each of these flights. In practice, you could probably get away with fewer, but the nice thing about three students is it lets us safely split into two teams. So something we're looking into doing for, we did a little bit on the last flights, and we were looking into doing for future flights, is splitting into a launch and a recovery team, and already having some people downrange, down where we expect the balloon to go, so it's not sitting there being exposed to the elements for as long after it lands. The mission itself, if everything goes smoothly, it takes about two days of allocated time, so hopefully over the course of a weekend. The way a traditional mission profile would look is we leave UNSW kind of early on a Saturday afternoon. 
We arrive at our location, which is three to four hours away, on a Saturday evening. Team is well rested. We get up in the next morning. We fly. We recover by mid-afternoon, and then hopefully back to UNSW a little after sunset. So the way a basic flight plan works is we want to launch as early in the morning as possible. None of our hardware, and the balloons in particular, are that fond of the sun. They don't like being hanging out there in the UV. They don't like being heated. We've actually had some issues with balloon damage from that. So we try to get there as early as we can, get everything off the ground as early as we can. The balloon, depending on how heavily it's loaded, will rise, I think it was we were getting with like six to seven meters per second of velocity. Um, it climbs for about 90 minutes, and it reaches an altitude of between 25, to some people reach up to like 35 kilometers. It's very dependent on how heavily you've loaded your balloon and how much helium you put into it initially. The way these flights typically end, unless we terminate them, is the balloon pops. So the balloon expands as the pressure, as the pressure falls, it reaches the top of the atmosphere. Eventually the balloon reaches its burst diameter, pops, and then it comes down. Right now, ours are taking about 15 minutes to descend. That choice of how long it takes you to get down is a bit of a trade-off in parachute sizing. If you have a nice big parachute, your payload comes down and hits the ground really gently, but it also drifts on the way down, so you have no idea where it's going to end up. If you have a nice narrow parachute, you have a lot more precision, and so you can, you're a lot more, your last known coordinates for that payload are maybe a lot more reliable, but it's going to go in proportionally harder, so it's a trade-off. And then the balloon lands, hopefully, in a nice open space. Last time we got a flat cow pasture, which had recently been burned down, which is fantastic. Um, and then we drive out, we obtain permission from the landowner to go onto private land, which typically falls on, and then we go recover the payload. We try to avoid areas with big bodies of water, forests, things that would make recovery difficult or impossible. You obviously can't guarantee that, but you can do a little bit of modeling beforehand and try to pick your, la your launch spots and your launch times so that they go in a safe direction. Um, the, really, the big external obstacle we have to overcome is getting legal clearance to do the flights. Um, the law is insane in that not just, that's not a snob against lawyers. In this particular case, the law conflicts with physical law. So I said we, fly, we can fly balloons which are no more than four kilograms. That's because they're what CASA called, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority calls light class balloons. Anything above that is a medium or heavy class balloon and your legal requirements get much, much stricter. The problem is the light class definition has a, a second clause in the law which says the balloon cannot expand to more than two meters in diameter at any point in its flight. And maybe some of you are much faster with your mental math than I am, so maybe you can work it out. But you'll find that a balloon that can't expand more than that before bursting on the ground will lift 100 grams, if that. That this is not, the, the legal category does not make any sense. So the way we get around this is the way everyone in Australia is doing it until they change the law, which is every time we fly, we ask for an exemption from the law. And they grant it because this is now a routine procedure. So that takes about, the way this works, we file with the Civil Aviation Safety Authority office in Sydney. We tell them about two weeks ahead of time, hey guys, we'd like to do a balloon flight. They talk to air services for us. Air services issues a legal exemption. That takes about a week. Then a couple of days before the flight, we phone them up and verify, yes, we're still flying, we're going to fly on this day. And they issue what's called a notice to airmen, which is a daily set of notices to people who are going to be flying in the area saying, guys, there's a balloon lost by some idiot students around. Please don't run into it. And then because so that's the kind of external paperwork we have to do. Because we're doing this under the cover of UNSW, we also have to comply with UNSW's internal procedures. So we have a little bit of stuff to do there as well, following field work procedures, making sure our WHS and risk assessments, risk assessments are all in order. It's pretty straightforward. It's all standard procedures for doing work here at the uni. So we've actually had two attempted test flights. We had our first very preliminary flight a few months ago. We were just learning this stuff and decided to just go kind of try it out. That time, we were still looking at the idea of flying out at uh, flying the heavy balloon. And if you're going to fly something that big, you really want to be in a good place to fly. So we went out to a place called Rankin Springs, which is seven to eight hours west of here. Rankin Springs is a great place to fly balloons. It's big and it's open and there's very low population density. So it's very unlikely you're going to land on something that someone cares about. The problem is, it is very far away and there's not a lot of shops out there. Just logistically, it's a difficult environment to operate in. We got there, there was definitely a learning curve. We were learning how to use our equipment. We were using it on the field for the first time. Things went a little slower than they should. But eventually we did get, we got the launch off the ground. I mean, it flew for quite a ways. I think at one point it was going more than 120 kilometers an hour. And we reached a max altitude of 20 kilometers. Unfortunately, the flight, that flight didn't end very happily for us. So we, at about the 20 kilometer mark, we decided this is a test flight. We want to prove that our separation mechanism works. 
So we dialed in the code, and we sent the separation, we sent the separation code, and waited for the next APRS packet to tell us what the balloon had done. And we're still waiting. So we, we still don't, we don't have, because we were able to recover the crash, we don't have a final result on what exactly happened to that. Our best assessment, based on studies we've done afterward, is that the balloons tend to vibrate a lot. This is something we on the way down. But especially in the upper atmosphere, when the parachute isn't properly deployed, the whole thing shakes. And the APRS, we, we, we took out our backup and did some testing on it, it does not like being vibrated, and it does not transmit properly if the antenna is undergoing the right kind of vibration. So that's our best guess for that failure mode. So we did some, it was, a, this was a very preliminary flight. We sat back, we did some evaluation. We knew the APRS had failed, probably due to vibration. We also had reliability of the payload. We designed it for flying, not for being transported. So it had been gotten banged around a little bit on the way there, and we had to do a little bit of rewiring and repair before we could actually fly it, which is not something we want to be doing in the field. Our launch procedures, we were tripping over ourselves a little bit. Field work is not something we do a lot here at the uh, undergraduate program in the School of Engineering. So it's a, kind of a new thing for a lot of people. And as I said, it was just a hard place to get to. It wore on everybody getting out there. And so for the next flight, we really didn't want to lose this one. So we put some, some redundancy in place for our tracking systems. We put in what's called a spot satellite tracker. This is uh, essentially, it's a backpacking tracker. So if I'm going out hiking into the backwoods, I can strap this on my backpack, and then the folks at home can see, oh, you know, that it'll ping out every 10 minutes my location, and it'll tell people where I am. And then if my mother is looking and notices that Stuart is sitting at the bottom of the cliff and hasn't moved in four days, then they'll call somebody and something will happen. So this has, it has extensive actual flight heritage on balloons around the world. It's a very reliable device. It's also built for human life. It's a, it's a piece of emergency equipment. So we had a lot of confidence in that. In case we, the GPS itself was the problem, we installed a short range transmitter. So from the in-flight tracking, we knew roughly where the balloon was gonna come down. We can do projections of that using tools that are available. And so even if all of our GPS cut out, this would just basically sing over the radio. And we could pick up this audio signal and then using a directional antenna figure out roughly what direction it was in. So it wouldn't be as nice as walking straight to the landing coordinates, but we did have a backup plan in that eventuality. And then because we believe the issues with the APRS did source to the antenna and the mechanical properties of it, we got rid of the off-the-shelf antenna that came with it and we installed our own, which was much more mechanically robust. We reworked the structure a little bit. We put a little bit more thought into how everything fit together and how everything held together so for the transport over. We had a go at better documenting our launch procedures. This is still a work in progress, but making sure everyone knew what they were supposed to be doing, making sure things were more formalized. And we also chose a new flight location because now we knew we were flying a light balloon flight. We didn't need the safety that hundreds of kilometers of empty ground provides. We could go a little closer. So this is our second flight. Um, BlueSat succumbed to its eternal fondness for puns. So the balloon flights are now called Sky Blue. Uh, this was Sky Blue 1 from Muzzlebrook over in the Hunter Valley. So that's only about three hours away. It's a lot closer, it's a lot easier to get to. This one we flew just this year, in January of 2015. We again ran into a little bit of difficulty. Our first launch of the day was late because we, we, our plan was to depart UNSW very early and launch in the early morning. As I said, these things don't like being out in the sun too much. The transport didn't go as smoothly. There was more traffic than we expected, so we got there a little late. We decided, because we had the backup resources available, to go for it anyway. And so we attempted a launch. We had the issues I told you about with the sun. So as we inflated the balloon, one side of it was sitting in the sun for quite a bit of time, and that side began to deform. So here you can see a good balloon, which looks kind of like a sphere or an onion. Um, by the time of that launch, the balloon was looking more like a potato. You could really tell what side was in the sun because it was bulging out in this direction. It was behaving oddly. We decided to launch it anyway. Basically, let's see what happens. It rose about three kilometers before failing in that weakened point where the sunlight had hit it. And then it came right back down on the edge of town. We were actually so close to it that we saw it land from the car as we were tracking it come down parachute. So recovery was really easy. So luckily, we had backup supplies. We had a backup flight window. We planned for this to happen. So we went back. We reevaluated our procedures. We had a bit of a debrief. We talked about what we could do better for the next day. Reworked a little bit. Of, uh, uh, re reworked a little bit. And then we were there very early the next morning. Having a dress rehearsal the previous day paid off, and this one worked. And so that, we, we were sitting in a restaurant after the flight, and we got that photo. That's the closest blue set has been to space, and we were real proud of that. That was, that was a great moment for everybody on the team, just seeing that, that vision up there with the black above us. So we got up to about 25 kilometers, successfully. Uh, we, had, we had position, velocity altitude tracking the whole time. We were able to successfully recover video from whole flight, which I can show you later if you're interested, it's up on the website. That's just a still from right up on the edge of the atmosphere. 
And we were also able to record some telemetry, so we got some thermal, the onboard computer was tracking thermal information at the time. And all of our recovery systems worked this time. So the APRS stayed functioning after we dropped, so we had APRS data all the way into the ground. We lost it after landing, but at that point it didn't matter because we had low enough altitude data points that we knew where to go. And as we were driving there, we verified that the spot tracker was still working. That gave us our exact GPS coordinates on the ground, and we were able to pick up our passive transmitter as well. So we were quite happy that all three of our, we didn't need that redundancy, all three of our options were working really well. So we want to follow up on this flight. We want to do kind of maybe one one or two more of these kind of development flights to really make sure we've got this down. So the next flight, we're going to be experimenting a bit with other balloons. As I said, we kept having that problem with thermal and solar damage to the balloons. One, we were following the launch procedures. We're starting to suspect it might be a difference between German and Australian climates. So if you notice the balloons, if you've ever seen them, the bomb uses down here, they tend to be white. They tend to, you know, they reflect a lot of sunlight. They're built for warmer conditions. Whereas the Germans, if you look on their website, all pictures are of them flying balloons in snow. So we're going to experiment with some other balloon manufacturers, maybe try to find some technology that's more suited to what we're doing here. We're going to keep refining our operational procedures, and so we really want to get this down to something that's not dependent on expertise and experience of individual members, but where we have a really solid BlueSat procedure that all the members know how to follow and that everyone can do leading into the future. So we're going to try to implement those things for a follow-up flight late this month. Ah, uh, let's see. So yeah. That's kind of lead into kind of the long-term plans we have for the project. So the three things that I would like to see the balloon flights do is become much more boring. I want them to become much more interesting and much more frequent. So when I say more boring, we, the last two flights, we, people had to do clever things. And people doing clever things in the field is good for them, and we're proud of them, but it's not nice. People should be able to just go out there and fly the hardware. There were occasions when we had to repair things, we had to figure out workarounds, and our procedures didn't do exactly what we wanted. So we want to get rid of that. We want, to, we want to keep experimenting with new technologies, but build up a really solid base of stuff that we know works in this climate, we have a launch site we know works, that we can just go out and do reliably, and then experiment from there. We want to get our procedures, like I said, we want to get this down to a science, and something that can be passed on to future BlueSat members, but not something that will die out when the current team graduates. And keep, and I, you know, also, along the lines of that, to keep building a pool of experienced members. So rather than having a few people who just do all the balloon flights, make it so that part of, we have new students constantly coming in and getting involved with these and building up experience before the older members graduate on. For more interesting, we want to be doing payloads. Like right now, we are pretty much doing test flights. We are doing these to show that we can and for the engineering exercise of building and flying a balloon, which is great. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a good experience for all people at BlueSat. But we could be doing so much more. Like I said, the whole point of this was originally was to test things in near space conditions. So as we reach kind of the end of this semester, we've got two more flights under our belt. We have a lot of confidence with our technology and our recovery systems. We want to start flying more interesting hardware on these balloons in the future. So BlueSat is starting to do more work with CubeSat technology. There's a lot of other folks at Axer are working with that kind of stuff. And so we hope that this is a way, you know, those are just on the right order of magnitude and mass to be tested on a balloon like this. So hopefully we can send them up. It's not quite flight heritage, but it's a really good way of seeing what you're building. Kind of a, it's a very cheap sanity check to see if what you're building is working in those kind of conditions. There are also scientific payloads that benefit in this kind of environment. I think the most, well, the most interesting one I saw was a Russian team that flies composite, cure, uh, composite samples up to the edge of space because they want to build composite structures in orbit. And this is a really cheap way to see how their composites behave and if their mathematical models are working well right in those kind of conditions. And then, like Elias mentioned before, in, the, in the introduction, something we also want to get involved with is outreach. So you know, we have a couple of team members who work at a high school, and they've already, that their schools have expressed interest in getting involved in this and kind of bring their students along or getting them involved in some kind of joint project. And like I said, we want to keep doing these more frequently. As we iron out the bugs, as we really get this down, that six to seven week lead, week, week lead time to doing one of these flights should compress down to three weeks, which is really the time it takes to obtain all your clearances from CASA and so forth. And so, if we've got a standard bus of hardware, we have people who know what they're doing, and we have a good working relationship with all the authorities we need to work with, in theory there's nothing to stop us from flying once a month if the, demand, the scientific demand and the funding was available for us to do that. So we, wanted, we really want to be, we don't want the technology to be limiting us. We want to be flying as much as people would like to, as much as people need to. So yeah, I guess take takeaways. I was, my hope for this is that this is kind of 
that blues, the what blues has to do with the balloons, it's, it's a fun project for our students, but we really want it to be a practical resource for everyone else in the university. So the ways we can help with that are we can talk about balloons, we can work together on balloons, and also we can get involved in outreach projects. So if flying a, uh, this doesn't really apply because I know most of the folks here, but if you do know someone who's interested in flying their own balloon project, I know we've had a postgrad group at UNSW flew their own basically for fun. Tell them to come talk to us. If you're interested in flying one of these as a hobby project or as part of your research or your work you're doing, please come talk to us. It's not super hard, but we've made the mistakes already. There's no reason you should have to. So, and we're always happy to talk shop. We can give you advice. We can tell you where to buy things. We can tell you what things not to buy. So, uh, you know, come by. Come by, have a chat. We also, as I said, we want to be flying more, other, more experiments. We don't plan to be building all those ourselves. We really want to be flying third-party payloads and offering this as a resource to AXER, to the Faculty of Engineering, and even people beyond. So we're, once we have our recovery solidly ironed out, we really want to start flying other people's experiments and making this available as a resource to people in this part of, this part of Australia. Hopefully those opportunities will broaden as we get more capabilities online. So right now we have a, very, a kind of very basic balloon. We go it flies up there, flies around, it comes down. Some of the things we want to introduce, we want to introduce better stabilization. Right now they just buff around a little in the wind. We really want to kind of find control over what's going on up there. And at some point we'd like to start having uplink and downlink really working so we can send commands to the balloon while it's in flight and we can receive data from the balloon before we have to, rather than just following at the landing site, pulling out the SD card, we want to know what's going on live. As we're working on CubeSat components, a lot of those technologies cross over, so we'll hope that's something we're going to be developing in the next year. And finally, for outreach stuff, we really want to get, if, if you have an outreach project that you know of or that you're working on that you think this might be relevant to, again, please come talk to us. Space often has a flair for the dramatic. Like, you know, there's nothing like a rocket launch or a video from orbit to really get people's imaginations fired up. But here, certainly here at UNSW, a lot of what we work with is on the microelectronics side. It's incredibly fascinating, it's incredibly important, but if you're a member of the public, it's not always easy to appreciate that without having to first learn a lot of the technical background. The nice thing about these balloon flights is they produce a lot of really vivid imagery. You get the, that photo, which I'm unnaturally proud of, so I keep, keep referring back to. And you get that, you also have, it's very tangible. Like if you're working with, say, high school students, you have something they can hold in their hands and work with and then know it's going up to the edge of space and then hold it after it comes back down. So we really want to get involved in one of those kind of outreach projects, both for promoting engineering at UNSW and for space in Australia, because that's, that's what we care about. That's what we really care about. Um, so yeah, that's my ramble for the day. Just to, yeah, just to recap, light balloons are a way of getting up to near space conditions very, very, very cheaply. It's not space, but it, dollar for dollar is probably as cheap as you're going to get. And it's something you can do very easily here in Australia where our options are somewhat limited. We want to build a light balloon capability, and that's, that's really the key words. We don't want to just have students go out and fly a balloon every once in a while. We really want this to be a reliable capability that, have, that we can execute on a regular basis. And we want to use this to provide a resource for UNSW and potentially beyond. And so rather than just having us doing it for our own sake, hopefully it can help you guys. Hopefully it can kind of make a benefit for the greater community. So I think everyone here probably knows this, but you can reach us at info at BlueSat. Well, that's illegible. I'll change that in a second. Info at bluesat.com.au. Our team's always working on Saturdays. If you ever want to come by and say hello, we're in the electrical engineering building on Saturdays, and we're usually hanging out in Electrical Engine 419. So if you have, if you want to come by and talk about balloons, if you have something you're interested in, something potentially you want to try to cook up, we're always happy to talk. So that's my ramble for the day. If anyone has any questions I can answer, that'd be great. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. Time for questions. Any questions? Oh, wait, you're still videoing. <laughs> <laughs> you did a very good job explaining what uh, what this is all about. Um, one thing we're interested in is if you have ideas, payloads, um, ways you can help. Uh, for example, Stuart mentioned the uh, stabilization. We've got ideas for. Um, for expanding our capability for doing interesting things. So, be happy to talk to anybody who's got uh, ideas. Well, anything, anything cool you want to try to cook up. Like, there's, I think there's really a lot of potential here. So, we've got our guys coming up with crazy ideas. Some of them want to put death lasers on it. We might not do that, but 
you know, we're going to, we, if there's anything that you think, if you're working on some project that could benefit from being tossed up to 25 kilometers, really come talk to us and we'll see what we can do. At, at the moment, um, the balloons, uh, Stuart mentioned that the balloons go up, but the altitude, the burst altitude is dictated by the payload um, to a large extent. The heavier the payload, the more helium you want, um, the quicker the balloon will expand, the lower it bursts. So, um, we do have at the moment a limitation of uh, something like 33 kilometers, 35 kilometers. Yeah. But um, eventually, you know, it's not uncommon to go to about 40, and we want to do that um, in the long term. The other thing is, Stuart mentioned the termination device. Yes, that is a hangover from when we wanted to uh, put BlueSat up, but we still want to develop our capability to a point where we can do the heavier class and we do need the termination device. That's actually legally required by CASA. Uh, if your balloon starts drifting um, to a place where it shouldn't be, you can terminate the flight. And in any case, it's useful for us. Like you mentioned, if we see the balloon, you know, change of conditions, the balloon is heading towards the lake, we can terminate the, the, the flight before so we, we don't lose our payload. I think that's, I've, I've talked about everything I wanted to talk about. Yeah. So. All right. Well, um, if there are no questions, uh, please thank Stuart again for his attention.